All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to week five. Uh, I can't believe that we're already into week five. It feels like this semester is kind of flying by. Um, but with that being said, I hope you're all doing well now that the semester is kind of starting to pick up. I hope you're all staying warm, that your classes are going well. Um, and if you need anything from me now that things are getting maybe a little more stressful, um, always feel free to reach out. We can talk over email or schedule another conference or whatever works best for you. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about organizing and drafting business messages. So, so far, we've kind of talked about some more conceptual things like company values um, and intercultural communication and things like that. And now we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty of actually constructing a business message. So to do that, we are going to do some exploring in the wonderful world of grammar, which I'm sure you're all very excited about, um, and come to understand the value of clarity and conciseness in your business writing. Um, types of writing you've done in other classes probably value much different things than business writing. That's why I put this picture in here. I'm sure we've all written an essay in some class that needed to be a certain page count, so you just kind of used fluffy words or longer phrases that you didn't necessarily need and that's the sort of thing that you totally want to avoid in business writing um, brevity is really key people are usually reading these kinds of documents in more maybe high stress or faster paced environments so you really want to learn how to get your point across quickly and effectively so when constructing a business message, so by business message, that could be anything from an email to a memo to a formal research report, um, things like that. And we'll talk more about kind of specific genres and their conventions throughout the entire semester. But when you're working with one of those documents, you'll start with research. And that doesn't necessarily mean like English 102 type research. You're not going to have to go and open up the library database every time you want to send an email. Um, it's just kind of figuring out what exact information you need to present and how you're going to find that information. So you'll ask yourself these questions. What does your receiver need to know about the topic? So just baseline information. What is the receiver to do? So do they need to pass on this information to someone else? Is it something they're using part of a, as part of a larger project? Um, are you giving them information that they need to put into their schedule? Things like that. How is the receiver to do it? So do they need any kind of specific instructions or guidance with the information you're giving them? When must the receiver do it? Is there some sort of deadline that they need to meet? Um, some sort of thing that they really need to mark in their calendar. This is a big thing, especially with messages like emails. Um, you really want to put that sort of important information at either the beginning, the end, or both when you're constructing a message. And we'll talk more about this later on. But say you're scheduling a meeting for April 5th, you want someone to really focus in on that information and really see it from the get-go. So make sure you don't bury information like that in the middle of your message because it's more likely to get lost. Uh, what will happen if the receiver doesn't do it? So what kind of consequences would happen if someone doesn't follow through on this information, doesn't use it um, as they're supposed to? And then this quote from the textbook that I thought was useful to remember Whenever your communication problem requires more information than you have in your head or at your fingertips, you must conduct research. So sometimes if you're sending a quick message, you can just kind of run through these questions and it's pretty simple. But sometimes when you're sending something that's more complex or with more, say, sensitive information, uh, you'll have to do a little bit of research. So there are a couple kinds of research methods when it comes to business writing, just kind of like when it comes to research for everything else. And first is informal research methods. So this would be something like searching your company or organization's files. Say you need to look up info on like a certain policy within your company. You can find that relatively easily. Uh, talk with the boss or whoever's in charge of whatever kind of project or situation you're working within. Uh, briefly interview the target audience. So this could be something like 
say in your workplace you're changing up a certain rule related to something, um, you can kind of informally just talk to your coworkers or people you know and see kind of how they feel about things. And similar to that, you can conduct an informal survey, say over email or just passing things around. Um, these aren't likely things that we're going to be able to kind of organically use in this class, um, but we'll try to kind of replicate these methods as best we can. Uh, next is formal research methods. So this would be what you use if you're, say, doing some sort of report, um, whether that be like a recommendation report, um, there are things called yardstick reports, we'll get to those later on, but things that are much more formal. So you're changing like a company-wide policy on something like dress code or um, maternity leave, things that really require lengthy research and detail. So for things like this, you might need to access some digital sources. So researching online, like we all do rather often, um, searching manually through those things called books or encyclopedias, maybe old files from your company, um, investigating primary sources and gathering primary data. So that would be something like, whereas with informal research methods, you just kind of casually talk to the people around you. You might set up like formal interviews or send out like a formal company sponsored survey. So once you've gathered all the information that you need to send your message you're going to work on generalizing or generating ideas excuse me and organizing information so as i'm sure we all know not all questions are answered through research so the research portion of this is really just kind of organizing exactly what information you need and here's where you're going to figure out what you're going to do with that information as far as presenting it to your audience so the textbook has these two things called brainstorming versus brain writing. So these are two ways you can kind of get the ball rolling when it comes to composing your business message. Uh, brainstorming is going to be something that involves multiple people, usually more of an in-person thing. In our current situation, it would be over Zoom or something. Um, but it's spontaneous contribution of ideas from members of a group. So everyone just kind of shouting out their ideas, jotting them all down, then seeing what works. Uh, so this method kind of values quantity over quality. It's just sort of getting all of our ideas out there on the table um, and then deciding what path to follow from there. So that doesn't always lead to the best ideas being used because it's kind of just a knee-jerk reaction to giving out your ideas. So that's where you may want to utilize brain writing, um, which may be a new term to a lot of you. Um, I had never heard it before this. Um, but that's writing out your ideas rather than speaking them. So even if you are in a group, it would be everyone taking a few minutes to kind of write down and really sit with and think about their ideas. So this can obviously be a little more thoughtful, kind of gives everyone times time to think through things, um, digest a little bit, and it can produce some more quality ideas. You'll, you might also want to work on formatting an outline when it comes to business messages. Uh, a lot of times even something as seemingly simple as an email uh, can really benefit from an outline. I'm sure we've all received a really long email that it just feels overwhelming, like you immediately want to close it because it's just difficult to parse through the information, uh, especially now when you get like some sort of announcement about COVID-19 or classes staying digital or in person. Um, even messages like that that are really quick and seem simple can have a lot of information to digest. So if you're someone who likes being really organized um, and kind of laying out things before you put them into your actual writing, this is a good method from the textbook for creating an outline. So this isn't the absolute end-all be-all format of an outline. People do it lots of different ways, but this is a good way to start if you kind of want to get into the practice of it. So when you're actually organizing your ideas and writing your strategy, once you've kind of gone through all of the preparation, uh, you can use either direct or indirect strategy. 
So direct strategy is going to give the main idea first, and then it's going to follow by details, explanation, or evidence. So say your workplace is changing the dress code policy. So if you're using direct strategy, you would come right out and say a memo to employees that say, we're changing the strategy, and then you would follow with, here's why, uh, here's research we did, and here's exactly what the new policy is going to be. On the other end of the spectrum, indirect strategy is going to list details, explanation, and evidence before the main idea. So going back to the dress code thing, you would instead list like research you've done, explanation for why you're making this change, and then you would announce that the change is actually occurring. So diving into that a little bit further, Direct strategy is a good idea to use um, if your audience is going to be pleased, mildly interested, or neutral to the message's content. So if you know that it's news that there or information that they're going to be happy about, um, information that they have really come to expect, um, or just things that are kind of run-of-the-mill messages, direct strategy is usually a pretty good way to go. Benefits of this strategy is it saves the readers time. Uh, they don't have to sort of sift through a lot of information to get to the main idea. It can set a proper frame of mind. Uh, they know immediately from the get-go of the message kind of what they're reading about, what sort of information they're getting, and it reduces frustration. So sometimes if you're reading through a long document and they just haven't gotten to the point, it can be kind of annoying. So. It kind of depends on the context here with direct strategy. Even if it's not necessarily good news that you're delivering, if you know that someone really values that directness um, and that they really just kind of need to know things right away, go ahead and use direct strategy. But if that's not the case, you want to go with indirect strategy. So it's a good idea to use this one if your audience is going to be unwilling, uninterested, displeased, or even hostile to the message's content. So if this is some sort of bad news, sensitive news, uh, messages that require persuasion, indirect strategy can be really good because it kind of sets the stage for your message, lets them know why you've made a certain decision or why a certain situation has come to be. So say you have to deliver the unfortunate news that an employee is getting fired from their position, indirect strategy might be better because you can kind of lay out an explanation beforehand. Um, again, not cut and dry rules for all of these decisions. It depends on context, your own personal feelings, the person you're interacting with. These are just kind of generalizations. Uh, benefits of the indirect strategy is it respects the feelings of the audience. Um, it facilitates a fair hearing. That means you can kind of say your piece and let people know the thought process behind a certain piece of news or information before you actually deliver it. And it can kind of minimize a negative reaction or soften the blow a little bit. So if someone understands why a certain decision was made or why something happened, um, might kind of make them feel better rather than just coming right out and delivering say a piece of negative news. So here's an example of an indirect and direct opening. Uh, so the indirect opening, our company has been concerned with attracting better qualified prospective job candidates. For this reason, the Management Council has been gathering information about an internship program for college students. After considerable investigation, we have voted to begin a pilot program starting next fall. We are asking for your help in organizing it. So you can see that they have kind of provided some backstory for what they've been doing, um, the fact that they've been doing some research, that they really considered this decision, and they kind of buried this because maybe this audience is going to be hesitant to help with this. So they've put it at the end so you can see why we've made this decision. Whereas with a direct opening, just says, please help us organize the college internship pilot program that the Management Council voted to begin next fall. So just right out of the gate, you know exactly what they're looking for. Um, 
neither one is necessarily right or wrong. Inherently, it really depends on context, the situation surrounding it, who you're sending it to, and things like that. So this is really where that audience analysis, um, knowledge of intercultural communication comes into play. So now we're going to kind of detour into talking about some more grammatical things that relate to business messages. So some of the most common sentence faults. Uh, if you've probably heard these before, we're just going to kind of run through them quickly. Um, sentence fragments, run-ons, and comma splices. So a sentence fragment is usually a broken off portion of a complex sentence. You can usually identify a fragment based on words that introduce them. So things like although, as, because, even, except, and so on. As an example, here's a sentence fragment. So because most transactions require a permanent record, period, good writing skills are critical. These are not two full sentences. They need to be connected somehow. So a revised correct version of that would be because most transactions require a permanent record, good writing skills are critical. So a good rule of thumb is if you can add a comma or one of these words, it might be a sentence fragment. These, again, take practice. Uh, it's looking at examples, kind of getting it wrong and learning where to revise. So if it's something you haven't perfected yet or something you have to work on throughout the semester, don't worry, we'll work on it. It's a really common mistake, um, and I'll look for it and catch it whenever I can. Another common mistake is run-ons. So that's when two independent clauses are not joined by a coordinating conjunction. So one of these, uh, I know them as and or for nor yet but so, but you can, there's all sorts of ways to remember them. Um, a, you can also use a semicolon or just separate it into two sentences. So an example of a run-on, many job seekers prepare traditional resumes. Some also use digital portfolio websites. Those are two separate uh, phrases that can be separated either through a period, uh, semicolon, things like that. So a revision, many job seekers prepare traditional resumes. Some also use digital portfolio websites. Again, these aren't always super easy to spot. Something that I really recommend um, when looking for run-ons and fragments is read your work out loud. If it sounds kind of unnatural, um, with a run-on if it sounds really long um, or there's just not a natural pause, you, it's a good chance you have a run-on sentence. Whereas with a fragment, if it sounds really kind of choppy, um, where you pause if it doesn't feel natural, uh, you may have a fragment. So when you're doing your revision uh, or proofreading or whatever you call it, read your work out loud. That's going to be a really easy way to kind of start finding these little mistakes. The last one is a comma splice. So that's when a writer joins two independent clauses with a comma. Uh, independent clauses can be joined with a coordinating conjunction, so one of these things, um, or a conjunctive adverb. So that's something like however, consequently, therefore, and others. Uh, they're listed in the textbook or you can just look them up. Um, you're never going to be quizzed or anything on what a coordinating conjunction or conjunctive adverb is, so don't worry about that. This isn't a grammatical analysis class or anything like that. Um, you just need to know how to avoid these mistakes. And once you've practiced them, they become much easier, I promise. So a comma splice, an example would be some employees prefer their desktop computers, comma, others prefer their tablets. So again, a be the best way to spot this is going to be reading it out loud. Because when you read it out loud, when you see that comma, it's where you take a pause or a breath. So if you're reading this, some employees prefer their desktop computers. Others prefer their tablets. That doesn't really feel like a natural place to pause. Um, whereas in the revisions could look like something like some employees prefer their desktop computers pause, but other others prefer their tablets. That just kind of feels more natural. Um, another example, some employees prefer their desktop computers, however, others prefer their tablets. Uh, some employees prefer their desktop computers, semicolon, others prefer their tablets. 
So the difference between these two is a semicolon um, can sub for a period. So if there are two separate phrases, you can go ahead and use a semicolon if you kind of want to keep those phrases together. Uh, if you have any questions about this or anything just seems unclear, just let me know. I know it's a lot of info, uh, a lot of jargon. Again, I don't expect you to be perfect at these straight away. Stuff like this takes practice. Um, so don't feel, try not to feel too overwhelmed. And if you ever need any extra clarification or anything, just let me know. Another important thing when it comes to composing business messages is favoring shorter sentences. So kind of going back to the fact that business messages are read in really fast paced environments or people are just glancing at them on their computers or phones. A uh, good rule of thumb is not letting your sentences exceed 20 words. So that doesn't mean you have to go through as you're typing documents and count the words in every sentence. But if you're reading through something and something seems especially long or wordy, go ahead and count through and just see. And if it's over 20 words, probably needs to be split up somehow. Uh, business readers want to understand things quickly, like I was saying, and short sentences can really help them do this. Shortened sentences can really help you kind of digest information quickly, um, pick out important points really easily. Um, but with that being said, strive for balance between short and long sentences. So try to get some kind of variety in there. No one wants to read really repetitive long sentences or repetitive short and choppy sentences. Uh, one more grammatical thing is active and passive voice. Uh, in active voice sentences, the subject performs the action, and in passive voice sentences, the subject receives the action. So we'll look at some examples of that. Uh, active voice would be Justin must submit a tax return. So the actor is performing the action. On the other hand, that in passive voice, the tax return was submitted by Justin. So the action is happening. Yeah. Good rule of thumb is it's in passive voice if it ends in by. So by Justin. All tax returns were reviewed by officials. You really want to use active voice because it's just clearer. It's more direct. Um, but again, it's something that comes with practice. So if it's something that feels fuzzy or you're worried about it, just try your best from the get-go and we'll work on it. Uh, another example, we cannot make cash refunds. Passive voice, cash refunds cannot be made. So you really just want to start with the actor. So we, Justin, um, the actual person or figure that you're referring to in the sentence should come first. Uh, active voice sentences, like I said, are typically easier to understand and shorter. Uh, most business writing is and should be an active voice. The only time you really want to use passive voice and when it can be useful is when you want to emphasize an action rather than a person. Uh, we'll kind of touch on situations where that would be useful later on when we talk about negative news, just because of the fact that passive voice can de-emphasize negative news. And we'll talk about why that is later on. Um, because it can conceal the doer of an action. So if you're giving negative news and you kind of want to step back from taking the fall for it, passive voice can kind of soften the blow with that. Uh, another thing, parallelism. Uh, this creates balanced writing that's easy to read and understand. So something that lacks parallelism, a wedding planner is in charge of arranging the venue, the flowers, and a person to take photographs. Whereas something with parallelism, a wedding planner is in charge of arranging the venue, the flowers, and a photographer. So the difference here is that it matches nouns. So you see they're in charge of the venue, the flowers, the a photographer rather than take photographs. So does that make sense? Instead of two nouns and a verb, they're all nouns. Uh, so another example, so I know I asked you if it makes sense. I'm so used to seeing people nod. Um, <laughs> our primary goals are to increase productivity, reduce costs, and the improvement of product quality. So here you can see increase productivity, reduce costs. Those are both verbs. So they're both, excuse me, those are both things that a company or a group is doing. Whereas the improvement, 
is a noun, so it doesn't match. Parallelism would be our primary goals are to increase productivity, reduce costs, and improve product quality. So all the verbs match. So really, it's a thing with lists. Parallelism is what really commonly pops up um, when you're giving some sort of instructions or directions. Parallelism is really important. And you really just want to look at whether you're describing things in the same way. Again, something that comes with practice, looking at examples is really helpful. Um, and if it's ever unclear, just let me know. So with all of that, uh, let's try to put some of this to use. Your steps for week five are participating in the week five discussion board. Uh, you're going to talk a little bit more about indirect and direct strategy, um, what you think might be best, and you'll look at it, an example of a message and try to figure out whether you think it's using direct or indirect strategy. Uh, this week I ask that you respond to at least two other posts, um, whether you're asking a question, making a connection, just try to be thoughtful with those. Um, you do need to respond to those posts to get full credits for the discussion, so make sure you do that. Uh, and then you'll complete the clarity revision assignment. So you'll be given a an example of an email that was sent that was not written clearly and you'll try to incorporate um, more organization, parallelism, active voice, revisions like that. So just do it to the best of your ability uh, and I'll give you some feedback. And of course if you need anything throughout the week just let me know. Um, otherwise have a good week, stay warm out there, and I'll be in touch. Thanks!